uh, a question for you. And that is about Jesus. Exploring the real Jesus. How many of you remember when Christopher Columbus reached the Caribbean in 1492 that he called the inhabitants of what he found Indians? Do you know why he called them Indians? Thoughts? He thought he was in the Indies. He thought he was in Japan, China, <coughs> South Pacific. He was actually in this newfound uh, territory. He was nowhere close to East Asia, China, Japan, and India where he thought he was. He was in the vast uncharted regions which we now live. He didn't know anything about them. He assumed the world was much smaller than it really was. And I'm wondering, and I'm thinking metaphorically at this point, if we've done something similar with Jesus. Are there vast tracts of who Jesus is that we have left unexplored? Have we intentionally reduced Jesus to a manageable, predictable proportion? Have we been looking at a decaffeinated Jesus a one-dimensional Jesus of our own making, thinking that we were looking at the real Jesus. Well, worship is the perfect place to encounter Jesus as he really is. And so as we worship and as we continue our series through Esther, we want to explore, who is this Jesus? What might we learn to expand our awareness and presence? As we worship, let us do that. Let us prepare, as Nancy shares this beautiful piece. Let us prepare our hearts and worship. <laughs> stand for the worship. 
scriptures remind us we have one purpose in life, primarily to worship God. As we gather, let us indeed do that. Join me in this call to worship. Our purpose is awesome. Let us worship God. God is in his holy temple. Let us all, let all the earth keep silent. When's the last time you've had a moment of silence? Have you ever had silence in worship? You are attuned to the presence of God. Let's take a moment. Let's be quiet in God's presence. Be aware of his presence with us. And now let us continue to call do not come before God like frightened supplicants, but as those who are confident, those who are wonderfully loved. Our high priest is Jesus, tempted as we are yet without sin, who is able to sympathize with our human weaknesses. Let us then boldly draw near to the throne of grace, that we may be welcomed with mercy and obtain assistance in every moment. Our hymn of praise today, the first three verses, the opening verses of Come, Thou Almighty King. <laughs> Christ as you gather for this moment and this day. 
shoulder replacement surgery that will come in the near future, but uh, keep her in your prayers. Howard Swickheimer, we've been praying for. He's at Berger Hospital. He's out of ICU, but dealing with internal bleeding at last. When I spoke with him, they weren't able to discern what was causing that, so uh, keep him in your prayers. Uh, Heather Martin's mother that was in hospice care did pass away, so we went to surround Heather and James and, and their family and that loss. And I've been asking you to pray for the Ukraine. It's under threat of invasion by Russia. Uh, some dear friends of ours, as I mentioned last week, missionaries in Ukraine, they have been asked to depart. Uh, Colleen, their wife, is already in England, but unfortunately Brent has COVID-19 and cannot travel. They're hopeful that he will be able to recover quickly enough to, to catch a flight to join Colleen. But, uh, I invite your prayers. And uh, as the others listed here, we have been praying for through these weeks and we continue to do so. Let us pray together. And I must mention that our prayer time will be a little different. Instead of me up here praying on your behalf, you are going to do the praying. I'm going to have you pray up here one of no. Relax. <laughs> Breathe. But I am going to help you have you participate. And this is what's called guided prayer. As I pray, I'm going to guide you in a few things and then pause and you pray along those lines as I direct you. So let us pray. Lord, as we enter into the stillness of your presence in this place, we'd ask that you would calm our hearts and minds. And Lord, we know that's a challenge sometimes because our lives and our minds and hearts get pulled in so many directions. Lord, still the storms that uh, are raging within us. Enfold us in your peace. But Lord, we come to this moment of worship. We come to these, this moment of prayer for a purpose. We first of all come in our weakness to you for strength. Yes, Lord, we come aware of our weaknesses, but we come to you for strength. So tell the Lord today where you most feel weak. And I'm not talking physical weakness, but life weakness. Where do you feel that? Ask the Lord for renewed strength in these situations. And I invite you to do that now. Lord, we also come aware of our sinfulness and ask for your forgiveness. We come in our sinfulness to you for forgiveness. Confess to the Lord where you feel out of sync with his will. Ask the Lord to, res to remove your inner rubbish that clutters your heart. And call out to the Lord for his forgiveness and cleansing. Take a moment to do that. So come wearied by life. We come for your refreshing grace. Where are you most wearied by life right now? Tell the Lord where you would like his touch, his restoring touch, to meet your need. Take a moment. to your love and your light. Lord, sometimes we lose our way. We even get lost in our life journey. 
Take these moments and ask the Lord to lead you out of the darkness, into the light, into the embrace of his love. May you feel that love today. So we come to you wearied by life for your refreshing touch. And we come out of our darkness for your light and love. Lord, renew, refresh, and restore us by your presence and your power. Now join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. We are continuing our series on the book of Esther. And with that today, I have a question for you. What is it that moves the heart of the king? That's the question we want to answer today. If you want to capture some of the context of that, if you remember this story, Mordecai and Esther for many uh, months, just kind of, or many years, just kind of blended in with the culture in Persia. Life was smooth and comfortable until they became aware that there was a plot to take the lives of all the Jews, not merely in Susa, but over the entire Persian Empire. And they were coming to the awareness, Mordecai first and now Esther, that they cannot sit on the sidelines. That they have to choose to get in the game to make a difference to help save their people. And with that, Esther's coming on board to realize that she's in this place where she is as queen of Persia for just such a time as this, to go before the king to plead for mercy and see this irreversible decree reversed. It was a risky endeavor. What is it that will move the heart of the king to, to act favorably on their behalf? As we draw upon this series, we have been, as you know, on Max Lucado's book, You Were Made for This Moment. I'm going to use some of his words for my introduction uh, today. As you know, several movies have been based on the life of Esther. Maybe you've seen some now through the years. They invariably have Esther as a ravishingly gorgeous woman, usually played by a Hollywood heartthrob who is chosen for the role. These movies are unanimous to the point that when Esther has her climactic encounter with with uh, Xerxes, the king, it's framed in this way. She stands at the doorway of the throne room. She's robed in elegance. She's radiant in splendor. The king cannot take his eyes off of her, and he's wide-eyed and open to power. And he says to her, what can I do for you, my beauty? The message implied is that it's indeed her tantalizing and stunning appearance that will sway the heart of now, no one doubts when the scriptures say that she was beautiful. But it wasn't her appearance that moved the heart of the king. The scripture tells a different story about this. She appeared before the king, yes. 
She did indeed do so at great risk, yes. And she was indeed beautiful, yes, she was gorgeous. And yes, Xerxes lowered his scepter to invite her into his presence, yes. But it wasn't her appearance that won his heart. Something else made the difference. We want to explore what that is today. And to do that, we've got to create some of the, the context. Esther, as we said, really came to the realization that she had to get in the game. She realized, perhaps for the first time in her life, that silence was a form of acquiescence. Her people, the Jews, had been given a death sentence. Esther has nothing, has done nothing up to this point. Up until now, she was either too oblivious or too afraid to act. Either way, her apathy was inexcusable. But now that Mordecai has challenged her to get in the game, this is how she responds. But what could she do? Things are determined. The king's already made his decision. Haman's already declared the death penalty. Neither are in, in the mood to change their mind. In fact, now that this rule of decree has the king's ring, signet, seal, and it's irreversible. They're making a statement, don't mess with King Xerxes. Esther faced the immovable wall and the possibility of death if she made the wrong but notice how she responds. And we introduced this at the end of last week, but it bears repeating because it captures the essence of her response at this point. Esther responds to Mordecai and sends this reply back to Mordecai. Go and gather all the Jews of Susa fast and pray for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will do the same. And then, though it is against the law, I will go and see the king. If I die, I must die. And so Mordecai went away and did everything as Esther had been him. And at that point, we realized that instead of rushing into the throne room of Xerxes, Esther first humbles herself and steps into the throne room of God. This is the new Esther. Until this point, she's relied upon her good looks, her beauty. But now she casts herself upon God. She will soon stand before Xerxes. And in so doing, she will indeed risk her life. And she will seek the reversal of the irreversible law. It's been sponsored by one of the most powerful people in the land, Haman. It is without doubt a prayer of desperation. Three days, no food, no water. Fears took her to sleep. Hunger gnawed at her gut. Dehydration dried her skin and hollow her eyes. She prayed a prayer of tears. But notice what happens next. As we open chapter 5 of Esther, we read these words. On the third day of the fast, Esther put on robe clothes into the inner court of the palace, just across from the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne, facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing there in the inner court, he welcomed her and held out his gold scepter to her. Esther approached and touched the end of the scepter. And the king said to her, What do you want, Queen Esther? What is your request? And I will give it to you even if it's half the kingdom. She, he was disposed to be favorable to her. But it wasn't her glamour that moved the heart of the king. It wasn't what moved and opened that throne Folks, it was her prayers and the prayers of her people. She came before the king of kings before she went before King Xerxes. It wasn't her beauty that swayed the queen. It was her prayers that beauty. You and I are called to do the same. Have you ever been in a situation kind of like Esther and Mordecai? Not in Persia, but in your own life. When you were at the end of your rope, an impossible challenge, it seemed desperate, you were out of options, without solutions. What do you do? Well, you do what Mordecai and Esther did. You fall down, you kneel down, and pray. Pray for God's mercy, crying out to God for his deliverance. And God invites us to do that very same thing. 
Well, I've been studying this, as you know, for these weeks, and it struck me when I read about Esther's call to prayer. What a reversal that was. And as I began reflecting, I began to realize that there are two completely different experiences, radically different, of coming before God and his throne of grace on one hand and coming before Xerxes on the other. I'd like to contrast them for a moment and then lead us into another prayer experience right in the middle of the message. Let's look at uh, going before the throne of grace. I've hinted that already in this passage, one to, or in this service, one to read Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. So then we have a great high priest who has entered the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. He has faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. And then one of the most climactic and dramatic and important verses in all the New Testament, verse 16. So let us come boldly before the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and will find grace to help us when we need it most. What a powerful passage. Let's explore a little bit of what it means to go before the King of Kings, the Lord. We can rely on his steadfast, trustworthy character. That's something you can depend upon. It's true and trustworthy. Because of that, you can come with full confidence and hope and promise. And whether we live or die, you know that you will be at peace with God, and that will make sense more when we can contrast it to King Zixi. And then you can come certain, certain that you will receive mercy and grace. You don't have to go wondering if you'll get some help. You will receive mercy and grace. It is a promise. Now, contrast that with what it might be like one before King Xerxes. He's capricious in character, which means if you come uninvited, he might lop off your head or welcome you in. It does, you don't know. You come full of fear and apprehension. You know that you may, might live or die. And you don't know if he'll actually hear your request. The results are completely uncertain. That's why it was essential for Esther first to come before the queen, to come before the king of kings, before she went to kings of cities. So I'd like us to take a moment, just a time out in the middle of this service, to pray. Do you have something you, that's urgent for you to pray before the throne of grace? Then this is your perfect opportunity. But notice the context. We have a great high priest, and that's not a word we use today, but it's a mediator, a bridge builder, somebody who connects us with the living God. He took on human flesh, lived and died, was raised from the dead, now ascended and dwells with God. Not only that, this Jesus understands our weaknesses because he's been through everything we've been through and yet overcome it. And we can come boldly. We don't have to come cowering in fear of how the king will respond. We can come confident that we will receive mercy and help. So what is it that's most on your heart today? Take it before the Lord in his gracious throne room. And I invite you just to take a few moments to pray right now, living out Hebrews 4.16. Come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. Take a moment. we have to confess. Sometimes when we enter prayer, we do so without much confidence. We come reluctantly. We come questioning whether you'll hear us. We come questioning whether there's mercy and grace enough for us. And Lord, you are trying to 
to tell us that through Jesus you have opened a new and living way, that you are our great high priest. You understand our weaknesses. You pave the way. You invite us to come into your holy presence with great confidence and great assurance. Lord, help us to live this out in our daily lives. Just like Esther did in these climactic moments in Persia. In your name we pray. Anyway, that's why it was so important for Esther to come first to the king of kings before she went to King Esther. But then, let's turn the page on this story. What happens as a result? Well, what happens is that heaven was set in motion. God moved in some of the most amazing ways to create some astonishing reversals of fortune. If you read through this story, there's all kinds of reversals happening. Even when it didn't seem like God was in control, God really was. Even when it seemed like Haman was, had the upper hand, all of a sudden he wasn't. God orchestrated the outcome through his providential hand, working behind the scenes in his quiet providence as we shared last week. Did you ever take notice in this story of some of the details, the amazing details that happen that are indicators that God was orchestrating these events. Look closely. Who would have thought that Esther herself, a Jew, would end up queen of Persia? Though, folks, that just didn't happen. And yet, here she is, queen of Persia. The hand of God moved in some amazing, unique ways to bring her to just to that place at just the right time. It's one of the great stories of providence in all of Scripture. You remember Joseph's story in the book of Genesis. It's another of those great providential stories. Joseph is sold into slavery by his jealous brothers. He ends up in Potiphar's household as a servant, ascends to a place of honor and respect. But then his wife had designs on him. And she falsely accuses him of trying to advance upon her. Esther, or Esther, Joseph is thrown in prison. And he's there for several years. But one of his gifts is to interpret dreams. He interprets the dreams of several of the prisoners, one of which is released, and he asks him, please remember me when you get out. He forgets. He's in prison for two more years. But this prisoner is in the court of the Pharaoh. And Pharaoh begins to have dreams. Nobody else in the kingdom can interpret. And this person in the court says, you know, I remember a guy back in prison who interpreted my dreams. Maybe he can help you. And so before you can say the word providence, Joseph has gone from prison to palace to prime minister of Egypt. Who would have thunk it? God's gracious hand. And the same thing is happening here. Esther, who would have begun to think she could be queen of Persia? And then think about this detail. One night, King Xerxes couldn't sleep. So what does he do? He wanted to read. How many of you read when you can't sleep at night? Yeah, well, maybe I'm the only one. <laughs> Guess what he asked to read? The book of reports for the empire. It's like reading the U.S. tax code or whatever. But guess what happened when he read this book of reports? He discovered the story about Mordecai. There had been a coup attempt. He didn't even that he wasn't aware Mordecai had helped in him. Mordecai had overheard this attempt, reported it to Queen Esther, who reported it to the king, and it was thwarted. And he realized in this book of reports, nobody had honored Mordecai. And so he was envisioning how he might rectify that and find a way to honor Mordecai. Well, at the same time, Mordecai's in somebody else's mind, Haman. If you remember from last week, the story goes, Mordecai not only refused to bow down to Haman, he did so repeatedly, day after day. This infuriated Haman. So much so, he wanted to make Mordecai an example for all the kingdom. He was going to create a 75-foot high pole and impale him on the top of it and leave him there for an on display for the rest of Susa to see. So you can see this collision course about to happen. King Xerxes is thinking, Mordecai needs honored in a new way. Haman's coming thinking, we need to make him an example to make sure everybody else knows not to defy the 
authority of the king. Notice the intricate de details of how this has worked out. The two of them meet. King Xerxes asks Haman, you know, what should we do to honor somebody who has served the kingdom in such an incredible way? Haman thought he was, Xerxes was talking about him. So he outlines this elaborate parade that he would parade through all of Susa. And I'd like to have seen the look on his face when he discovered that Xerxes was talking about Mordecai and not himself. And so in a moment, God orchestrated these details. Mordecai goes from a future on a 75-foot pole to having it being declared Mordecai Day in Susa. God is in the details. God is at work in ways we can't even begin to see. He works in small moments. The insignificant becomes significant. God is ever orchestrating the details of innumerable lives through the millennia of time to do what God thinks best. Amen. Do you dare to believe that God can orchestrate some of the details of your life for his purposes? One despondent mom experienced this in a powerful way. She had been through too much life. It had beaten her down. She was giving up. She was planning on taking her life. She had an intricate plan of how she was going to do it. One of that, part of that plan was to buy some gifts, parting gifts for the kids. She goes to a bookstore to buy a book for one of her children. She didn't know what to get. She asked the owner there, what would you suggest? He takes her to a counter, and of all things, has her look at a book called Tell Me the Story. Guess who the author was? She thought it had a pretty cover, so she bought it. One of her parting gifts to her children. She got some other gifts as well. She made her purchases. The reason we know this story and how it comes out because she took the sack of that purchase and wrote a note to Max Lucado. And this is the note that was on that sack. This is just a short note to say thank you for your wonderful book, Tell Me the Story. I went to the bookstore today and purchased gifts for my kids. Several weeks have been playing with the idea of suicide. I've been struggling in so many ways for so many years with life. I've just had enough. In fact, I've had difficulty believing and feeling that God is real. I bought this as a goodbye present I have no idea what the book says, but it uh, was supposedly Christian, and it did have a pretty cover. <clears throat> and so the next few hours, I drove around crying. Somebody else was watching the kids, and I was waiting for my children to go to sleep so I could go home, leave their presence, and then disappear. Disappear forever. But God led me on a little detour. My car, it didn't run out of gas, it ran out of oil. And it makes this horrible pinging sound, this, this clicking sound. I tried to find an open express loop, but none were open at that hour. In frustration, I, I was just beyond myself. I needed my car to stay in one piece just for one more trip home and one more to get to the place where I was going to end it all. But I pulled into a nearby parking lot, sorting through some of the gifts, writing a few notes to put with them. And I began reading this book, Tell Me the Story. And it was as if God was reaching through the words of those pages and touched my heart to, to realize that this is a God who knows and understands me. This is a God who I can trust with my issues and my problems. This is a God I can know. And so I'm writing to thank you for that beautiful book. So 
instead of taking my wife and I and going home, and I'm going to read some stories to my kids, and we're going to finish this book together. And I'm going to drop off this note on my way. What a story. A little detail, like a little book. I'm, she didn't even know what was in it. But the words captured her heart. God is in the details. God is into divine reversals. And I believe yours is coming. I dare to believe that God has something in store for you. Assume that God is at work. Move forward as if God is moving forward in your life. Give no credence to the voices of doubt or fear. Don't cower to struggle. Don't be intimidated by how things look at the moment. If you can't see God's hand and you can't make sense of his ways, that's okay. Just do what you know to do. Trust that God will take care of the rest. Be patient. Be patient. Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. The prophet Isaiah said. God is in control. God is in the details. Not foreign kings or despots like Haman or Hitler. Or others. He will determine the course of history. God in his quiet providence is still in control. And he'll have the last word. Well, these are nice stories. Certainly true for Esther and Mordecai. Certainly true for this mom. But do we really believe it's true for us? Do we believe that God can work in the details of our life? That God has divine reversals for us? That God is working for our good and his glory? As we come next week, I invite you to experience a God of great turnarounds because he has one for you too. Let us pray. Lord, once again we confess, sometimes we think this is true for the characters of the scriptures, for those remarkable people who experience your interventions and your divine reversals. But we have a harder time believing that that can be true for us. So Lord, help us to live out verse 16 of Hebrews 4. Come boldly to your throne of grace. Looking for your mercy to find grace to help us when we need it most. And Lord, even when we can't really see it, to trust that you are at work for our good and your glory. May it be so. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing verses 1 through 3, a song we often sing at the beginning of worship. Now we're singing it at the conclusion because it captures God's Providential grace. Let's stand together and sing. Praise to the Lord. The
Amen. Thank you for the added touch. Let me see you in Again, dare to believe God does not work in the details of your life. May it be so. Let's sing the Bell of Peace.